All right, guys, we just finished round five. Yeah, and we decided to mix things up for today's video, so we've switched sides of the cameras. We've even switched rooms, so we gotta switch a room. We're hoping that switching the rooms might switch some results a little bit. We didn't go over two this time, but we yeah. came really close. Yeah, it was uh, it was a tough round actually. I went down pretty quickly. You guys will see that game first. And I managed to take a game that was completely equal and make it very instructive by nearly losing and. Probably should have should have been losing, but thanks to time control, I, I salvaged half a point and I'm still on even score. So two and a half out of five. Yeah, it'll be it'll, that'll be an instructive game for sure. And okay, at least you got a positive result. You, yeah, you are a master. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, it's always nice to draw someone 280 points higher than you. But uh, I was really worried the whole game. I was like, am I going to share this game that turns into a loss? That would not be so fun. Because here I was yesterday on yesterday's video talking about. Uh, you know, playing against those players who want to draw. And today, it kind of felt like I was that player, and I should have been punished for it. Um, that would be brutal. That would have been brutal. Have some land medicine. <laughs> so, anyways, you want to just go ahead and get us started yeah. on your game, and let's do it. Let's do it. All so right. today, I was I was paired up again against the grandmaster. Uh, his name is uh, not sure about the pronunciation, but it's Helgi Don Ziska, and apparently, he is the first grandmaster from the Faroe Islands. And I think the strongest player ever. Fairgrounds. Yeah, so he's, he's quite well known. It's actually interesting whenever you play a player who's on the best of their country, they, they come with a sense of pride. You know, every tournament they play, they're always representing their country. At least that's how I feel when I play any of these guys who are like the number one. Right, and this guy's qualified for the World Cup at the end of, uh, you know, towards September, so mm -hmm. uh, he's definitely using this as an opportunity to try out new things and see if he can catch some IMs by surprise. Yeah, he's he's quite a strong player. He's uh, 2550, so I was expecting a, a big fight. He played e4, which he normally does. I played my trusty Sicilian, which failed me this game. Knight f3, e6. Okay, so my preparation involved seeing a lot of g3 from him, and he recently started playing b3 as well, so I focused on these two moves. Um, in the game, he played b3, uh, I played b6, this is kind of the, uh, I think this is Van Kampen's recommendation on his, uh, his series on the Taimana. Um, and here, he surprised me with the move d4. Uh, I was expecting bishop b2, I think this is kind of normal, bishop b7, and bishop d3. This is kind of the way they're playing this. In fact, this is what Kasparov played against Wesley So in the um, the Blitz uh, event they had in St. Louis. So for some of our viewers, I mean, even for me, optically, this bishop on d3 isn't making sense. What's the like the long-term goal? Why aren't we playing a move like maybe d3 and maybe leaving it to be decided for this stuff on bishop? I think White's idea is to try to push the pawn to e5 and then play like queen e2, castle kingside, knight c3, and then use the e4 square, and I think the bishop just kind of supports that. Oh, okay. It, it's a very ugly move to me. Uh, in fact, I don't think I could I could play this way as white. Um, I was just going to play d6 here, and I mean, I, I think black is going to get a perfectly fine position. Knight c6, knight f6, bishop e7. I, I can't imagine black has any real problems here at all. Right. To me, this seems like more of a blitz opening rather than uh, a main line. But he plays d4, which after the game he told me he feels like this is a stronger move overall. And this was a surprise, but I've actually faced this once before last year against the legendary Larry Christensen. He played this against me at the, uh, the National Open in June. And so in that game I took, as I did today. And the idea of this line of playing d4 now is that White is going for some quick knight b5 ideas. So this is actually, if you're not prepared for this, this can be very uncomfortable. Um, their main point is that after bishop b7, which is the most natural move, they just play knight b5. And they offer the e4 pawn and they play knight c3. And then once the bishop goes back, I don't know, c6 or b7, they're going to play bishop f4 and I have serious problems with Yeah, this, looks, this looks pretty, pretty yeah. terrible. This is uh, very, very uncomfortable. I, I mean, I think the computer finds a way, but without computer preparation, I'm not going to find my way here over the board. Of course. Against Larry C, I played a6, he played uh, bishop b2, bishop b7, bishop d3, I played knight c6, he took, I took, he castled, and I never fully equalized, I think I played here. Why is that, for some of our viewers, I mean, it looks like, you know, you're one move away from like d6, bishop b7, typical hedgehog stuff, why, 
Why is it that white keeps this slight plus? Um, I think it's just a development advantage. Like, knight f6, knight d2, I think in the game I play bishop c5. If I play d6, I imagine he's going to put his pawn on f4, and then maybe even queen f3. I guess you just don't have time to play your typical queen c7 or queen b7 or c8 castles. And... Yeah, it just feels like white is faster here. Like, maybe queen h3, and he's already threatening down. Yeah, this is, this is pretty strong. Um... I mean, I haven't checked it too carefully, but that's what went wrong in that game. So in this game, unfortunately, you know, I didn't really analyze that game too deeply. I don't remember my improvement, so I already started thinking here for quite some time. Uh, I ended up deciding just to play d6 right here, just to, let's say, try to get out of his preparation, try to just get some normal setup. Uh, he played knight c3, knight f6. I was expecting him to go for a Marazzi, maybe just c4, like this, and then we'll just play a hedgehog. And I think black will at least get out of the opening alive, and he should be fine. Here, I don't know, bishop b7, let's say bishop e2, or maybe e4 pawn is hanging, maybe f3, or queen c2, knight d7, castles. And it's just going to be a hedgehog, white has more space, but black is going to be super duper solid. But he goes very, very ambitious. He plays knight c3, knight f6, bishop b2, bishop e7. And I'm actually, I don't feel too bad about this game, because, I mean, he completely outplayed me. And, in fact, he made it look easy. <laughs> Plays queen e2 here. Which, very, very creative move. His idea is he's going to castle lock. Oh. And just play very, very aggressively. Now I already have some dynamic problems. Um, if I play a6, as I did in the game, I think castling here was the strongest move. Now my only move is queen c7. Otherwise, he plays e5, I take, and knight takes e6 is a problem. Ouch. So I would play queen c7 here, and he should probably play g4. And g5, and he gets, uh, I think, a pretty serious initiative. Right. Um, after the game, we felt like this was even better for white. In the game, he plays g4 right here, which we thought maybe is inaccurate because he hasn't forced queen c7 yet. So I played bishop b7. I'm not sure if this is best still. Um, I think maybe I should have played a move like perhaps h6 I needed to play. So what if he queenside castles now? Would you have to play queen c7? So now if he castles, I can play bishop b7 because he's already pushed the g pawn. So the rook on h1 is a problem. There we go. So he doesn't have e5. But I think eventually I would probably just put my queen on c7. Mm -hmm. But maybe, okay, knight d7 is more useful. Um, so I was expecting, if I play h6, the issue is he plays bishop g2, and more or less have to play bishop b7, and now f4, and whatever my next move is, he's actually going to play g5, well maybe I can play a better move, like queen c7, he still plays g5, I take, I play knight d7, and he has key idea, g6. Right, we can the e6 pawn. Yeah, even if he get, I get this check on h4, I think it's not a big deal for white. Mm -hmm. g6 is usually a, a killing idea. You know what my issue here was, Isaac, is that, as I'm sure all my viewers know, I wrote a book on the Open Sicilian. Mm -hmm. So I'm very familiar with these positions from white's perspective. So all the ideas that he came up with, I could find also for white, right? right. And I found for black expecting them. The problem is for black, I am not exactly sure what the... <laughs> the right way to mean all this stuff was. In some cases, you know, Black it, Black is always behind in development, but he, he just gets the right squares under control, and he ends up getting okay, or he gets counterplay. Right. Here I just couldn't manage. Um, well, in any case, okay, he plays g4, I play bishop b7, he plays g5, so I just allow this without h6, knight d7, and here he played the right move h4. I was really hoping he would play f4, because then I have h6 here. Nice little trick. And now if he plays g6, now I think this is different. Because I get a check on h4, and he has to put his king on d1. And I play queen f6, and, and I think white's king here is, is not comfortable. If he takes, I can take with the queen. And of course, white can't wait, wait for g6 with h4 because of the pin along the h file. Exactly, that's the other thing. Is that his, um, he's still underdeveloped here. So I take, and then I take on g5. And now black is doing awesome. <laughs> yeah. But he's, okay, obviously too good to allow that. He played h4. Now I don't have the, the check on h4. Um, 
So I played knight c6, he took, and castles. Okay, here I realize my position is pretty critical. Um, and I play the move b5 here because my idea is to basically provoke him into playing this knight d5 sacrifice. So let me explain my reasoning here. At this point, white's plan is to play like f4, f5, maybe throw in knight d5. Um, according to the engine, I think castle here is the best move. That takes nerds of steel. Exactly. I mean, I, I just thought this is this is the biggest example of castling into it of all time. I just think yeah. he plays f4. We were analyzing this a little bit after the game, and okay, let's say b5, even if white plays a3, I don't know, rook b8, f5, just feels like white is much stronger. Or maybe, maybe he has to play rook g1 first. Even but anyways, if there's nothing immediate here, though, I mean, white is, white's position is just so much more comfortable to play. Yeah, I mean, white's just faster. Yeah. F5, F6 is coming. I mean, this bishop on B2 is an absolute monster. Just defending the king and putting pressure on D7. I mean, I don't know. Maybe MVL feels comfortable here for black, but but I certainly don't. I'm of course. Just not a knight of player, I have to say. Um, so after castles, I thought if I play queen C7, um, he might just play knight D5 right away, and that looks pretty strong. So then I thought, okay, let's play B5. And my idea is I'm threatening to play b4 and then put the bishop on b5. Meaning, if he doesn't play knight d5 now, he's not going to get a chance. So bishop g2, for example, I'll play b4. Now knight d5 isn't nearly as good because I do get a tempo with bishop b5. I have more space. In the game, my bishop was stuck on b7. Right. Um, and here he committed his bishop to g2 already. He's probably going to want to put it on h anyways. Maybe this is still good for white, but it's certainly uh, an improvement for black. So I was hoping that maybe he didn't feel ready to play knight d5. Uh, a lot of times a player just is more comfortable when they're provoked. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping that okay he would just allow me, or maybe next move I just play knight b6 and I cover it completely. But no, he goes for it after not much thought actually. Really? How much time would you say that he spent here? Uh, he spent like maybe five minutes on this move. That's pretty quick for, for a cycle like this. He, yeah. must, uh, he must feel very comfortable with these lines. Well, clearly, yeah. I mean, it's very thematic, and right. it's not hard to calculate. I mean, I was also expecting this, basically, and I realized that white's position is going to be good. I just figured I don't really have a choice. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I did, but during the game, I didn't feel like I did. Um, and the lines get pretty interesting, and I, I was impressed at how effortless he made it seem after mm -hmm. this point. Okay, so I have to... Well, I thought I have to take. He thought maybe I could still castle here, but I figured he takes on e7, and now the dark squared bishop is just... Right. This is too much. I thought I'm worse here without any extra material. So, okay, I just thought, let's just take. I mean, I had some ideas about how to defend, but they didn't work out. Bishop b7. He takes a second pawn. And here... Not really much of a decision. If he plays bishop f6, I just play king f8, and I'm threatening to take. And right. white is losing time. So he plays a clearly superior bishop b2, just out of the way. Mm -hmm. Bishop d4, I can take the d5 on. Right. So now here I, I started thinking quite some time. I, you know, I had to figure out what to do here. My first thought was to play queen c7 and try to castle queenside somehow. The problem is after queen c7, I realize he's going to play rook h3. So castling is out of the question, oh, wow. not only is my bishop hanging, but rook is coming to c3. And if I do nothing, rook is coming to e3, second rook is coming to e1, and my bishop is dying. Yeah, this is a good move. Apart from the immediate issues, the real trouble with the sack is he just puts the bishop on g2 or h3, and then he just runs the f-pawn down the board. And this bishop is hanging, hmm. you know, by a thread. So that wasn't didn't seem really playable. Um, I had some other options here. None of them are satisfactory. Is there like a possibility of maybe playing king f8 and then bishop takes g5 check, just giving the material back? I was trying to bail out this way, yeah, with king f8. Um, of course, I'm always going to be worse because he just puts the king on b1, right. and then his bishop is just stronger. I was thinking, though, maybe here f4 for white. Yeah, I mean, f4 is definitely a, a candidate move. Um, I'm trying to think what I was expecting here from him. F4 is very, very possible, and then just kills my idea, right. and then just F5 next in a lot of cases. 
Um, he also might just play like bishop h3. I mean, I could bail out, but I think this would be kind of a short term uh, prospect. Like, even though I get some squares, like rook e8, knight e5, I think it's, I think my position is just too weak long term, especially the dark squares. And I guess you're just kind of the number of pawn islands here. Basic. Yeah, yeah. School <laughs> chess. And just the, the two bishops are so strong. Of course. Um, but, you know, I like your move, f4. I think this just doesn't even give me the chance. Mm -hmm. um, usually black just tries to shore up by putting a knight on e5. But right. f4 is always coming. I was comparing this to a lot of the positions we looked at in the book, because we looked at a lot of these knight d5 sacks. Here I think I was underestimating his position, because normally in these lines, white also has a knight on d4, and black has another knight somewhere, and then white has like bishop g2 and knight c6 ideas, and it's even stronger. Right. So here I thought maybe he doesn't have such a serious attack, but I was clearly wrong. The two bishops were just killer. Okay, eventually I settled on knight b6. So I'm hitting the pawn. And I was really hoping he'd play bishop g2, because now I would most likely play king f8. And now I'm definitely threatening, because the bishop is hanging on g2. Right. Um, and if he plays f4, maybe I have time with like queen c7, rook e8, consolidate a little bit. Although even this looks pretty good for white anyways. Um, but he found a much stronger idea, just queen e4. When he played this, I realized I'm actually just dead. He defends the pawn and he hits h7. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not super worried about losing the pawn if and only if I can actually castle, but I can't. Because um, I wanted to play... Queen c7 here. Um, the answer is bishop h3, maybe. In fact, I think I did play this move, and he played bishop h3. Yeah. Um, actually, I have to show a, actually a very nice line that I just was just reminded by my mouse of king d7. <laughs> um, after bishop g2, I realized that I came up with this move, king d7. Actually, I thought this was ingenious, and I was hoping <laughs> to play I realized, actually, yeah, I wanted to play this in the game. Um, because now I'm again threatening bishop takes g5, so I get the tempo. Right. And if he lets me, I can walk over. So I thought maybe I have a half a chance here. Uh, unfortunately, queen e4 just kills the idea. Um, because now king d7 um, runs into... Well, for one, you can just put the bishop on h3 right away. And uh, I think he had another reason why this is just... I think also he can just take the pawn, probably. Right. Yeah, so it's just not not nearly the same. So I was really hoping to get that in the game, but alas, it was not to be. Okay, so bishop h3. Now I'm not, never going um, queenside, so I play king f8. And just simple chess, rook h, e1. Uh, I'm more or less forced to play rook to e8. And he played f4. Of course, I'm turning bishop takes g5 check. Now I have to find a move. Um, this is a fun position in the sense that you know black has an extra piece, but in reality, white has just stopped everything from moving. Yeah, I mean my pieces are terrible, especially you know the knight on b6, no squares. Usually I get the c4 square, but this b3 is unusual. And here, very good point. Bishop on b7 is dead. Bishop on e7 is dead. All my rooks are dead. The queen is terrible. I mean. And white already had two pawns for the piece. Yes. So Once he picks up h7, there'll be three. And... It's just that lost. I mean, I could resign here. Um, there was one nice line for him back in this position after bishop h3. My first thought was to play bishop c8 to trade the bishops. But he can take on h7 and can't castle. And I thought I could play bishop takes h3 here. And if he takes, I play king d7. My rook on a8 is protected. And let's say, for example, queen takes pawn, um, I play a move like rook f8. I thought I'm getting out here a little bit, because my bishop is coming to f5 next, I have a mate threat, who knows? <laughs> right. Maybe some knight c4, I don't know. But you can play queen h7 instead. And that takes away bishop f5. It takes away bishop f5, and I'm just lost. Right. Um, like the bishop is just trapped, f3, queen f5 check. Oh, that's nice. So, none of this is working. Of course, in the game, I always wanted to try to put my rook on c8 to get some counterplay in c2, but he just covers it with one piece and it's really nothing. 
So, okay, I had to play king f8, rook e1, rook e8, f4. And now I just have zero moves. Um, I think bishop c8 here runs into... Um, I feel like queen h7 is an idea, right? Because bishop takes h3, queen h6, and actually you're getting right. rated, right? Queen h7, yeah, this game over. Uh, exactly. Yeah, I can't play f5 because bishop g5 with queen h7, queen h6 is lost. So, really, really nothing I can do here. Um, I also wanted to play bishop c8 here, but he has this nice move, bishop f6. If I take on h3, he's going to mate me, so my bishop will protect it, and if I take here, um, he gives check, he takes, and queen g8. Because I played bishop c8 and I covered my back rank. Right. <laughs> That'd be a key way to end this game, though. You definitely get on chess 24. <laughs> we, will, we will find a way to get on chess 24 yeah, we'll by the end of this, point, right? this, uh, yeah, this turn. But, yeah. um, okay, so just to show how the game ended, rook e8, f4, I played rook g6. You know, trying to induce uh, f5. Mm -hmm. So bishop takes g5. I'm sure white is probably even good after he sacks the queen. Um, he played h5. And I actually thought maybe he couldn't do this because the rook takes g5, but of course he calculates that he can still take the pawn. Right, king safety. And I have to move my rook, queen h6 check is coming. Actually in the game I didn't even see this check, but I thought rook g1 is good enough. Mm -hmm. And of course it is. And black is just getting mated. Um, the line I saw was takes. I saw this mate, not queen h6 for some reason. And this bishop comes to g7. So this is the more fun mate, though. Yeah, this is not bad. Okay, so he played f5. I went back. You know, whatever. <laughs> queen h6. And then, you know, just took the pawn and queen h6 resigns. Mm -hmm. So brutal, right? They see made it look effortless. Just yeah. Put the nine on d five, put his piece in the center, push his pawns. So I guess you've had the yeah, one positional right. effortless game and the one tactical effortless game. Which game do you think you were more impressed by, Josh's game or Helgi's game? I think I definitely learned more from the game against Ferdell because in that game I wasn't expecting his moves. In this game, every single move he played, I was kind of expecting, and I was like, "Yep, that's as strong as I originally thought." <laughs> And my position is still bad. I think in this game I just chose the wrong setup from the opening, or maybe I missed some chance to get counterplay. As you can see, my pieces just never got into the game. Against Josh, it was like I didn't even know what was coming until it hit me. Right. So. So you're three out of five. So you're still plus one. Three out of five. I'll play down tomorrow. Um, I think I'm playing a, a local. Yeah, I think you're playing someone from Iceland. Right. And uh, yeah, hopefully I'll win, get another chance. To be embarrassed by another GM, you know. I guess for you it's tough because every time you've played up so far, you've been with the black. black pieces. Yeah, and so. the trend will just continue. Right. So you're gonna have to you're gonna have to break through, but you know, hopefully, hopefully you're learning something theoretically from these games. Oh yeah, the games are very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I'm enjoying I'm enjoying going over them because I usually don't go over them so deeply during the tournament. Right. I feel like it was the opposite for my game this round. Instead of a theoretical lesson, I I, I had a a long Long endgame lesson. Yeah. Well, let's let's switch yeah. from 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 a Take perfectly over. simple looking game. I, I let a, a draw go to something where I, I I had to bite my nails a little bit and say, all right, am I holding? Mm -hmm. um, okay. So so you're playing a local. Right? I'm playing. I'm playing a local. He's twenty two. He's twenty two forty ish. So mm -hmm. good. 200, 250 points higher rated than me. Um, and I think so far this tour, this this draw would be the highest rated player of drawing. Mostly because I haven't played that many people higher rated than that. In the tournament, right? Not No, like in my entire trip. Uh, because I haven't really played that many people higher rated than that. Oh, I see. Um, so I, I knew that this would be a tough game. Okay, I played d4. And, uh, okay, well, if you do database search, you'll notice that a lot of my 1d4 games are London's. But sometimes I'll use 1c4 as a d4 transpositional device. But today I decided I'm going to play d4. And I was expecting d5 and would play like a normal game of chess. Mm -hmm. you know, no London system for you today. Um, I wanted more than this, but I think my opponent saw my games and he was like, I don't want to play against a London, I'm not going to play d5. So, d6. And he had played this twice before. Uh, I don't think he had had that many good results with it, uh, so I, I didn't focus on it that much in my prep, but I definitely looked at it. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually had a game like this at Leon's um, in the last round of the Leon's Open that I won, but I, I played the opening badly, so I, I couldn't repeat that game. So I played Bishop F4, so now I, I, I will go for, you know... Stopping E5. Yeah, stopping E5, <laughs> obviously, but, uh, you know, I'm just going to go for my simple setup now. G6, and I C3, Bishop G7, E4, uh, Knight D7. So if he had played Knight F6, this kind of transposes to, like, my main line. So Knight, knight D7 is a nice way to kind of sidestep that, Knight F3. So we've got a, a perk. Yeah, we have a perk. Um, I've, I've had this position in several different rewarders now, I think. Um, one, with one knight f3, with one d4, so it, it wasn't so much of a surprise. And okay, my idea here, ideally this bishop is here, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but my idea was, okay, I'm going to trade. You know, I'm not, I'm not worried about drawing a higher rated player. This is, this is Black's concern. And I thought, okay, it might be a little nice idea to try to insert this because Black hasn't had time to play c6 yet. Right. And I would love, love, love for him to play this move f6. I come back. There's no knight f6 to the idea of going to g4. And if he plays knight h6, I just play h3, bishop c4. And he's got long-term problems. So, you know, already I feel like we're just playing chess at this point. We're not really in a theoretical mm-hmm. discussion. Black played c5. Um, and I think d5 is probably the best move. But for today's game, I I, I, I had an over-the-board inspiration and decided that it's time to take on c5. Um, well, maybe we should look at d5 because it was instructive. Why yeah, so, good for white. so d5 is good for white because this knight is already here on d7 and this bishop doesn't have time to get to g4. And in the Benoni, it's important. Here to this bishop. But the other thing is, this knight usually, um, you know, it can go from a6 to c7, and it's this knight that goes to d7. So we have a little bit of a, um, a switcheroo here with the knight. Yeah. We have a superfluous knight I situation. Mean, basically, in Bononi, like, black is going to have less space in this position, especially since he hasn't made the exchange, mm-hmm. like, e-pawn for c-pawn. And when you have less space, it's so important that your pieces find the right squares. Here, he's already misplaced the knight. Right, and he can never play e6 because of this d6 weakness. The moment he plays a move like a6, I'll play a4, so rook b8 doesn't make any uh, rook b8 doesn't make any sense. This bishop is without a home. Um, I probably should have explained this, but okay. Oh, I mean, yeah. I was inspired over the board uh, <laughs> because I found an interesting idea where I thought I had virtually no losing chances. Okay, so for one, knight c5 is the only option. Um, Brian Smith wrote an article on chess.com like three years ago. I don't remember why this is like one of the few chess articles I remember from chess.com. But the problem is for um, black is when you have this pawn on c5 and this kind of structure, like if you were to just take all the pieces off the board, the c7 square is always very weak. And so white always has these ideas of coming into the center. Whereas the same can't be said for black. This e5 pawn doesn't exactly give white any weaknesses. So of course I'm not worried about this move. He plays knight c5. And okay, my over the board inspiration was to play this e5 move. E5. I think if I don't play e5, I have nothing. And um, okay, I thought another option was for him to play bishop c3, takes. Um, okay, if he does this, I was going to play e5 again, um, but I thought more critically was this line, and I just had to double check everything. And I thought at the end of this line, I'm actually doing okay, um, because I'm materializing, I'm attacking two things, so I'll take on e7. Yes, these pawns are weak, but I'm quickly, you know, I'm quickly getting my king to save me. Yeah, and the bishop is so good here. Right, I figured pair of bishops, and I trust with my intuition here. So my c5 is probably most natural. I played e5, and it's time for black to think. And the thing that definitely worked for me in this opening is that uh, I feel like black has to play accurately, and when he plays this move in 96, I think he's already not happy with his position. Um, now, I, I should I should have a funny little mention here. Um, in the last three games, um, Fiona, who does the commentary, has actually visited my game. I don't think consciously she did it with the decision to visit my game. Um, but every time she has, I've got a nice position out of the opening. So please come watch my games. Um, <laughs> Good but, luck, Trump. Yeah, I, I think uh, she came to my... The first game of mine that she came to was Alina Ami's game. I think she probably knows Alina pretty well, considering you know that they're both in the reporting. And then she takes a lot of photos, and my opponent last round was a little kid. And of course, how can yours is taking a photo of a little kid? So somehow, subconsciously, she was drawn to my games. Uh, today, she stopped playing my game, and I had a great position in the opening. <laughs> so I'm very thankful for this. Okay, so knight to e6, and I think it's already a critical moment. If we play just a simple move like bishop to g3, I think queen a5 is already like a strong option, and the idea is that we're okay allowing this because now this bishop becomes a monster, and we're always repicking up our pawn on c3. And, th- and these lines are a headache to calculate. Um, and the same goes for like a move like queen d2. Already queen a5 is really strong, but at the same time, I think there's no reason why you know we can take once and then play queen a5. Yeah, just um, take the bishop. So these are really strong lines. So I think it's actually really important to insert this move bishop to b5 check. And the idea is that 
bishop d7 queen uh, and queen d7 and now the knight occupies these two squares this queen isn't easily coming to the game so white just has a small positional plus occupy queen side um i actually thought maybe kind of like my game with alejandro ramirez black should have considered king to f8 if he wanted to keep things short because mm. i mean the way things turned out in the game if i just played the end game correctly he had no chances whatsoever to win you know if i play bishop g3 now we can talk about the different possibilities of bringing in the queen i mean of course b2 is weak and Black hasn't said anything about this bishop. So I think this would have been an interesting way to keep the game going, but of course, this is so committal, and what has White yeah, really I given? imagine Queen A5, White just castles. Yeah, Queen Now we're not worried about the capture on C3. Yeah, and actually, Black is really behind in development, so I wasn't worried about these, but I thought maybe this would be sharper. Um, because one, once once we reach these positions, I, I think White has nothing to worry about. So he, he played this move working to D8, I played ed6, and the idea is simple, you know, if he plays this, okay, that's fine, we have 6 versus 6, he has some pressure here, but my thought was, he has this isolated pawn, and the only way he can damage my structure is to give this dark squared bishop, and I decided to evaluate the position here, because, okay, there's concrete lines that you need to look at to make sure you're not dropping anything, but for the most part, this is something that you observe to try to figure out who is the better position, and I think, because this, uh, of this trade, I actually have this nice square on d4, and I can generate some nice pressure. I think objectively yeah. the position is equal, but only white is playing for a win. Yeah, I'd say white is better. Um, but yeah, white is better, but I don't know if you can say so much like white is already winning here. No, you know, like the, 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 there's work to be doing. It's slightly better, it's like pull. Uh, and that's the problem with taking care. And my opponent thought for a long time that he played this movement to h6. Uh -huh. um, and so already his idea is that simply he would love for me to take, the idea being that he gets a tempo on my queen. So yes, he just gave up a pawn, but now I'm falling behind in development, he wants to play this move to f5. Mm -hmm. So I decided, okay, maybe it might be smart to play this move queen to e2 first, and maybe I have an idea of playing rook to d1. Of course, I'm not really thinking about queenside castling, so when he castled here, um, this was not really on my agenda, because I think we should pick c3 is actually a move to be reckoned with now, because now I have an unnecessarily weak king. Um, and, okay, even if I have an extra pawn for it, why, why give black all the fun? So, okay, I castled in this position, and uh, I thought this was a critical point because uh, once black plays knight f5, d7, queen e7, if I do nothing, right, if I play a move like rook to e1, takes, takes, bishop takes c3, b takes c3, and don't try to convince me I have an extra pawn. But you do, you have one extra, you have six? Yeah, you, look, you count them, but okay, do you, do you count this as two pawns, do you count this as two pawns? I, I have a hard time, I mean, like... I, I, I well, the king side is fine. The queen side, the, the queen, weak. the queen side is pretty weak. But you cannot, you cannot really make the argument that white is that much better anymore, if at all. But, you know, it's still like, it's still an extra pawn. It's may not might not might not be so I, I valuable. Don't, I, I don't really think this is holding for that long. I mean, black's at least got a solid structure. I, I don't really see why black should lose this game anymore. Oh no, no, just um, you know, you would take white here, right, every time. I mean, okay. If, especially if this were blitz so we could talk about white playing for a win, then yes, but I think practically black is going to hold. I mean, this, black is one move away from, you know, starting to regroup, or maybe even just simply to shift everything over right one file. Yeah. I, I think that the, these will be very hard to hold, and in fact, it's easy for white to mess up these both But, you know, pawns. the thing is, it's not about holding both of them. What I found about these double pawn situations is, like, if you trade one of your C pawns for the pawn B7, then you're clear pawn up. Yeah, but okay, it's nice to say these things as another thing to do them, right? Once I play this from queen c5, my idea is to play b6. And so now this, this half open file is blunted, we play this with the c8, we've got targets. I mean, this is obviously what Black's plan is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if Black is fine, it's because of some, like, concrete idea, I think. I think this is pretty concrete. I mean, I don't really see a way for white yeah. to slow down Black here. Yeah, you know, queen e5 or something. Um, so yeah, if, if, if I were to play like this, I think this causes problems. But I found a nice idea here, which is play bishop b5. And the idea is that, okay, you can play f6 and kick me back. Um, but the idea is now you don't have bishop to c3, and I have an extra tempo, and this knight, which was originally strong on e6, is now no longer stable. I'm playing moves like rook e1, I'm playing moves like queen c4, and I have extra pawn, an extra pawn, <laughs> a more meaningful extra pawn that is, and this queen can come back to b3 at the right moment, should black try to play for f5, and I can move this knight without having to worry about b2, and create pressure against b7. Maybe against, a, you know, if this were engine versus engine, an engine can hold, but I feel like practically white has all the fun in these yeah. kinds of positions. Uh -huh. Black realizes too, and after a long thought, he played this movement to g5. Ooh, tactics. Um, so here, I thought for a while, actually, these positions are quite tricky because, okay, takes, takes, 
takes, takes, and takes. And the idea is that after king takes g7, this is actually really hard to stop. And this move is really hard to stop. Um, I don't, I, I, I can't stop both at the same time. Should I play a move like Rafael d1? I think I just lose my extra pawn, and I maybe even black can argue he's playing for the win. Uh, there's no easy way to defend this. You know, this is, you know, maybe doing fine, but the problem is now black has two active moves. Well, knight d4, he just takes it. Oh, yeah, knight d4, yeah, I saw this thing in the game. My bad, I should I should. I mean, it should still be equal. Well, yeah. this is definitely not equal anymore. Yeah, I mean, um, just give up the f3 pawn. I mean, black can argue he's better, but he'd be bad at debating. <laughs> me, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, black is, black is the side you choose, but I mean, it, it, at this point, it's heads or tails, right? But, um... Yeah, no reason to go into this. No, no reason to go to this line if I have to. And I realized here I actually have a nice way to play. And I, now it's time for Black to answer the question, how much are you willing to give for damage pawn structure? Because before, um, you know, there were more pieces on the board. Okay, we take. But okay, should he play a move like Bishop to G7 again? And I take. Now, you know, okay, Black can always take this pawn. But at least now we are getting active development. This group is coming yeah. here. Again, I think objectively it should be equal, but okay, you know, we need black to play this move first. But this gives us quite a critical tempo compared to the game. Right. Um, totally better. So after knight f3, he played bishop takes c3, which is the best move. Queen takes e7, uh, e knight takes e7, here, 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 here. And this is petering to a draw, and should this be a grandmaster game that you were going over? You see this move, and the players shook hands and agreed to a draw, right? And actually, after this move, h4, I offered a draw with forgetting about the Sophia move. Mm -hmm. My opponent leads over the table, so we have to play till move 30. Um, but yeah. And so, so this is move 23. This so is move 23. To draw so I, I, in my mind, I'm like, okay, he knows this is a draw. I'm just going to play any seven moves. And so you guys just play seven moves or a great draw, right? Yeah. Well, this would have <laughs> this would have been a nice nice way to play. Um, Rook to b8, takes, takes, um, and now I missed it. I missed the obvious draw, uh, which was rook d1. Of course, this pawn was not hanging because of this fork. Um, so, okay, should he play this movement to c6? Now rook d2, and now we, now we are shaking hands. So there's no way that uh, white is, uh, you know, white has a passive rook here. White does not have a passive rook at the end of the line. Right. So this was the way to go. I was, I was bogged down thinking about these lines. And knight to c6 because now now I do have some problems. Um, it's just hard to get the pawn and yeah, actually it would be really easy to um, mess up in these positions uh, as we saw later. So like let's say you know it's not even Root so easy. B7? You know if I try to activate you know if I try to activate right you know it's uh, it's it's only one move away from a catastrophe. Yeah. So you know I white has to be extremely careful in these lines already. Um, but okay, I thought after knight e5, I'm just restricting this knight, the knights come off the board, pop, pop, pop. I play a4, of course, the last thing I want is to let black get easy play by putting a pawn on a3 and making a target out of a2. Too many red squares. All right, um, and the idea here is that simply, you know, black would eventually march the king and a2 becomes a target. Objectively, you know, this is not how I would like to carry out this position, so I play a4, he played a5, g3, rook c4, king g1, king g7, king e2, offers draw. And of course, I'm waiting there, and you know, I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna get my draw. This hasn't taken us that long to get here, and you know, what can I say? Half point, we had a slight advantage out of the opening, but black played well, and I can never complain about drawing a two, uh, play two, like a great tire. Black says, let's play on. And okay, I'm like, okay, he's gonna play like five moves and give me this draw. This turned out to be not be the case. In fact, the game went for another 33 moves, yeah. in which I was. Perilously close to losing. Probably so, lost at one point. Yeah, definitely lost at one point, I think, is our conclusion on this. Um, so what can I say? So I don't think White has made any mistakes so far, but what would be nice is that my mentality is not, oh, this is a draw, you know, this is perfect. Um, you know, now that this game is over and I have something to think about, it, I remember watching the Millionaire Chess broadcast where Ray Robson, I think this was in the second year of the tournament, Millionaire Chess 2, he drew in 24 moves, and the TV said, no, I don't think so. You have six more moves to make. Mm -hmm. And um, this was, of course, being analyzed at the time by Robert Hess and uh, Tanya Sachdev, who was actually playing in this tournament. And Robert Hess was like, yes, you go back, you play six moves, this draw offer never happened. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, Ray Robson went on to win that game. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, of course, this is psychologically traumatic. And this should have been my mentality here. I offer a draw, 
If he takes it, great. If he doesn't take it, the draw offer never happened. We're still playing chess. Right. I still actually have to prove that we're equal. You know, if this pawn were here, um, then we're pretty locked up and it's pretty simple. But in actuality, because this pawn is on each four, there's actually some play left in the game. Um, so, for example, king of six, king d3, already, so I've now used too much time. it would have been better just to leave your king on g2. Like, yes. Uh, so, for one, your coach of Sean. King f1 was not accurate at all because it now takes two extra moves to get to f3, which I didn't realize at the time was where I needed to go because keep in mind I'm in La La Land. Um, and that's not a happy jazz movie in this case. Um, so King g2, here, here. And the idea um, that my coach pointed out was after, uh, well, actually, no, not even here. Just playing, what was the move? Rook b1 or rook d1, doesn't matter. And the idea is that it takes and we cut off the game. And then simply this is the draw. Yeah. Um, but see, this requires you to give up a pawn. Yeah. And go into this position where the rook is defending actively rather than passively. And you need the confidence to know that, okay, I have an active rook, mm -hmm. and I'm going to be able to draw this. Right. I mean, like, okay, so part of the thing was uh, in this position, you know, on my mind is we're going to agree to a draw. Everybody's in a happy place. Uh, and, you know, the last thing I want to do is give him this extra pawn and make him feel like he has something to play for. Um, so this is why I played this move. King to f1, thinking that, okay, I just activate my king and we're happy. But already after king d3, I think it's too late. Um, because if you see, I play king d3 because I realize this king could come in if I'm not careful. Yep. I play king f3, and now he plays f6, and g5 is coming. And already, I would say black is a very good chance as to win. Um, he will create an outside pass pawn. My king is going to be stuck on this side of the board, and at the right moment, black is coming to this side of the board. So, already... And passive rook? Is it, passive rook. Is it cancer? Passive game. Remember yesterday's game where my opponent played passively and at the right moment, pop, and yeah. the, the, the game shifted and uh, I was winning? This is exactly what happens here. But yeah, I mean, in the middle of the game, you can have one passive piece, you'll still be okay. In the end game, you only have two pieces on the board. If they're both passive, you, you have issues. Right, well, I, I would argue that my king is active. It's just that the, the, this rook is terrible. No, no, black's king is active. Your king is just... I mean, my king, I'm shielding your pawns. Okay, my king is my best piece. I think we can agree well, on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I played rook to a3, making sure that this check is impossible. He played this move g5. And all of a sudden, I started to sink and say, oh, wait. Yeah, that's so easy. Wait, what happened? And of course, it's too late. Uh, in fact, when we were showing uh, my coach this game, he says, oh, I think if already block is winning. Um, and this is an interesting point in the game because usually, you know, you can tell based uh, on how spectators react to your game, what they think, you know, if they leave immediately, you know, there's a pretty concrete decision. And, you know, I think for the most part, people who came, like GMs who came and looked at my game for a brief second, they looked and then they left. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, when I'm calculating and calculating, trying to figure out how to hold this position, that's not, you know, not what you want to see. So I already have realized, all right, back to the tank, game of chess, this is move one. Uh, unfortunately, things that I don't really think get that much better. H G five and F G five King G two. So right H5. here, let me let me throw a line at you. I'm wondering if you could have played um, Rook C three at this point. I looked at this right. I, I think I know your idea. You want to be able to use the fact that you can check up and down. Yeah, right? play G four. Yes. Um, I didn't so like this. Why play G four? You play King E three. King E three. Active. Takes. You can give. Let's say check. I think at this point it's too late though. If I think it's symmetrical, we're fine, but I think maybe it's too late. Well, I just want to put my rook on a6 and do nothing. Uh, okay, I see your point. Okay, uh, let's play. Well, we play here, you play rook h5, so maybe I should. Yeah. I think I have to play king g6. So, rook c6. c6, okay, if I come up here checking again. Yeah, I mean, if you don't approach, then I'm just going yeah, to so I have to check again. Yeah. Okay, give another check. Yeah, this is probably a draw. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to approach with the king, yeah, right? Yeah, and then once we give up this pawn. But then even black is not exactly playing for two results because you can always try to win the g4 pawn. Yes. Right? This and is actually a weakness. You now. give up your rook for the a pawn, you have two pawns, white is not worse. Yeah, so yeah, this is. I mean, at least when I was watching, because I'm already. I, my game finished so quickly, <laughs> I just got rid right. When I was watching your game, you know, I was looking for these opportunities. To just always go active, just give the pawn, but go active. Just for your soul, you feel better when you have an active position. What if he plays? He play? No, no, because he's always got uh, rook c5. Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, this is probably good, good enough. Um, but I mean, I don't know about the the time situation because it's in the well. His, his his time is more critical than mine. I think I have about seven minutes. Mm -hmm. I mean, my mentality here is this: you know, I, I don't want to. Uh, 
I don't want to make a move that has long lasting implications right before time control when I haven't had as much time to think about it. Um, yeah. But maybe, maybe I should have. But a lot of times, times that's when the critical decision yeah. just just happens yeah. to be. Yeah, I should have just trusted my mm-hmm. gut. I mean, I think I think the practical point here is that if you're going to go passive, like holding a fortress, mm-hmm. you need to be a hundred percent sure they're not going to break your fortress. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just going to have more chances with active defense if it's like fifty fifty. Right. Yeah. So here I played King G two, and I thought that I have this idea of putting my king on H three, and then kind of like creating. You know, kind of a buffer. Mm-hmm. Um, I played this faster than I originally wanted this move, Rook F3. Comes back because I had to double check on my lines and make sure I'm not being mated this way. Right. This would have been embarrassing, but okay. Fortunately enough, I always have Rook C3 or F3, I think. But mm-hmm. okay, Rook C3 is most accurate. Yeah. Coming over. So, yeah, this is fine. Um, so, King H5 makes sense, and now I better trade. Okay, he takes. If he plays rook takes, I'm pretty sure that it doesn't matter. I can just give him both pawns at this point. It's a theoretical draw. Um, if you get your rook behind the, the yeah, pawn, yeah. Um, well, okay, with this rook like uh, with this um, with this rook like this, I can give him this pawn for free after move like king d three, rook c three, rook c eight. Just go back. Yeah. Just go back. So this would have been a draw. Um, so it's actually really important that he takes with this pawn, which he did. And I played this move f three, and I thought I should be like maybe not okay, but maybe this is. Maybe this isn't so bad because, um, okay, I think if I don't play this move and I play like, a, I don't know, rook 2 the problem is he checks and then this king starts to come in. I figured once this king hits this square, I'm probably toast. Um, so I played this move f3. But what if we just like went active again with a move like rook c3 instead of f3? Rook c3, I think this is already too late. Because I, I, I kept on finding positions mm-hmm. where we trade these pawns, but the rook cuts off the king and the king is going to be in time. Well, let's just say, like, let's say we get check. Okay. And yeah, actually, I was looking at this position game. You know, I was thinking, what if we just played f4 here? Okay, can I show you the line that I was thinking that has the same idea? Mm-hmm. Okay, so here, um, okay, I was looking at, and this applied later because I can always look back at these positions. I was always looking at, um, let's say he plays here and I play rook f1. I was looking at these positions um, and seeing if I can get something because it was my rook behind the pawn. Um, but I was I was never so sure, and I also Black was never committed to taking. But okay, let's pick your line. Yeah. Right here. Um, oops, not this way. Where are we? So rook c three forty one. Rook c three. Rook rook a four. Yeah. Rook okay. here. Ten g six. Ten g six. Let's say f four. Four. And so your idea is that if I take this pawn, then goodbye. Um. I feel like there should be something here. Maybe not. Check, you're going to take. Okay, so maybe we should just go to the back rank. You're going to take. Mm-hmm. It comes down. I guess this is just a simple draw. Yeah. Comes here, and now this will transpose to the game. <laughs> we get exactly the same position that we had during the game. Yeah, yeah. That's funny, actually. That's actually really, that's really poetic. Okay, good. So I could have saved 20 moves here. Um, there was something I, I, I wasn't so crazy about. Let's see through this book. Um, I can't remember what it was that I didn't like. Maybe there's nothing. Maybe I'm just ghosting. Um, yeah, a lot of times you just see ghosts in yeah. this kind of position. Yeah, I was thinking I could have this F4 idea later, but maybe... Uh, I can't remember what. I mean, at this point, you know, I wouldn't want to say like I'm tired or fried or anything, but I'm definitely demoralized in the sense that, I mean... They had to the, defend the no, dead conflict. Yeah, I mean, I, I, okay, we, we look at this position and you tell me I might lose this, right? I feel like at this point the trend of the game is also very effective. I mean, I was very disappointed in my own technique after this. Well, I would, I would earlier than this. Here, you, your rook is passive, so you already have to solve some some problems. Yeah, but this this is a very clear, very clear but black is in progress. Now, yeah, yeah you're even worse. Uh, yeah. But okay, I, I thought I, I saw some opportunity here. Ah, uh, yes, okay. So yeah, I was looking at these lines. Rook at four goes here, and I was trying to make heads or tails of these lines. And I ultimately decided that this and this is no good. Uh, okay, obviously I can't trade rooks, but the idea was that this rook is cut by that he just simply blocks his king over. Yeah, this is one. Yeah, so I, I was kind of sad about this. Um, so here I realized this is just for my best interest to sit, and he plays rook c4, and so I'm like, oh, he doesn't see anything, so this is cool. <laughs> I'll play rook a2. And he played king f5. Okay, so I actually have a really nice idea here, which is that when I play rook a3, he goes here. I actually have this artificial way of cutting off the king. In the sense that no matter what move he makes, I'm playing this move next. 
because I'm always in time for this pawn ending. I'm sure our audience is this. The key is to not follow him this way, but to come down, so that so way I get to, C1. to C1. Square. C1 is the critical dynamite square yeah. where all things go to zero. Now, if the pawns were one step lower, like a4 versus a3, right. it's a loss. Yeah, um, so yeah, it's important to come down this way, because I think if I just follow down this way, then he gets to C2 in time. Um, in fact, there's a chess.com drill with this exact endgame, like two A pawns, black is an extra pawn, and you have to find the right move A4. Right. But I think the critical pattern is also the one where it's the two rook pawns and the king comes this way through from A to the center and then back. I think that this is the more famous, you know, rook and pawn on game one. Oh, right. right so right. like the idea to find this is not so unnatural because you want to come here. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, this was important. So king e5 is actually not really that possible, which to me, it was encouraging because I thought, okay, when we do this position, it's not so easy. Uh, he played rook f4, and already, like, time-wise, it's getting a little bit uncomfortable, and I have to make some decisions somewhat quickly. And I thought, okay, maybe I should let this pawn push one, because I'm, um, I might be able to consider these f4 ideas again, where these pawns are on the same rank, and it would be harder to defend, but at the same time. Um, so I played king g2, king e5, and I thought, maybe I'm doing okay, but I think I already am lost. Um, yeah, I think this was not good to allow the pawn to h3. But if I can't allow the pawn to go to h3, then it's not so clear what I want to do now, because this king will just simply come over. Well, okay, so he plays king d5? Yeah. d5? Okay, let's think. King d2? Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not sure, actually. You know, again, I always just want to go... Well, I think the once, once the king comes here, it's too late to go active, because the king controls all the critical squares you, want, you would want for your rook. And the problem with rook b3 is he always has rook b4. Uh huh. Um, well, let's try. Well, yeah. I mean, you don't have to play. Um, I don't want to play King H three. I mean, you don't have to play King G two originally. This was my idea. Like, okay. so you just play Rook B three here. Rook B three. I actually thought if I was going to move the Rook, I should play the C three because doesn't he have this move already? That's a Rook C three. Yeah. Oh, okay. I see. You. I guess it transposes, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Uh, take some check, is this good? Mm -hmm. Okay, but now I think it doesn't. I mean, we have this F4 idea. F4 again, yeah. Uh huh. And if we come this way, F4, and here, I guess you just put King here and now well, black, black is, is in trouble. No progress, yeah. Black is in trouble. <laughs> um, yeah, so this idea is actually critical. This is uh, the idea I eventually used to draw the game, but after. Great right. pain and difficulty. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, this is not this is not a smart move. <laughs> what can I say? This is not an example to follow, but I guess it shows the audience what to do. You know, why, why, why it's so to hard to it? defend a position that, that seems so simple. I mean, during the game, I'm thinking like, wow, I'm actually going to lose this. I have, you know, I, I might actually have to quit chess now forever. You know, yeah. um, and, and the responsibility, too. knowing that we have to show this, we have to show you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know how I would have brought myself to do it. I'm having a hard time doing it now. Because um, it feels like the more we go over it, the more opportunities we find uh, for white to equalize. But that, that's all instructive. It's very instructive. Just to show you, like, you know, you can make four in accuracy and you still have a chance in rooking games. Exactly. So h3, rook a1 is more or less force. And then when he plays rook b3, I just completely realized I'd messed everything up. For some reason, I thought maybe he would play, like, rook h4, I'd play rook h1, and then it's hard enough to take this pawn. But I think even that's not good. Um, rook b3, king f2, king f4 here, and for yeah, some inexplicable lost. reason, he plays king g3. Yeah, this was surprising. I mean, um, he can just take the pawn. He didn't see he could take the pawn, huh? I think he saw he could take the pawn. <laughs> okay, so with rook takes, I had this funny little idea where, oh, wouldn't it be so nice if it were white's turn here? Um, let me let me show you why. So if king he goes g4. here, 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 I think this move actually draws. Because, of course, if he takes, it's still me. Wow, does he have any other options? Okay, so where does he go? I don't know. Because the problem for him is once he comes here, I'm checking here. And now I have the active rook. More active, more active. <laughs> so king well, I mean, this rookie guard is passively defending this pawn, right? So, okay, he plays king here, I'm just going to come But here. now you're threatening to check. I'm always threatening to check. Yeah. And, okay, he has to start coming over. The question is, is this or not? No, check and take. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a media draw. Yes, this is a media draw. Um, so yeah, this was, I, I'd seen this with our limited time. I mean, like we both had like two or three minutes each here. Um, but I thought, oh, wouldn't it be really nice if it were my turn? But I think, okay, already this move is, this move is posing some serious questions. The, yeah. the good news is that he has going to have a hard time defending this. So I think 
Now this move is okay because he doesn't have rook b4 like before. But I think he just plays rook a3. Okay, three, right. And I think I'm gonna be in trouble. Um, and your king, even if you take the straight pawn, is very far from the a pawn. Yeah, I mean there's hard. some there's some computer ways sometimes. Well, maybe not computer ways, but like theoretically known ways to draw. But um, it's hard to set up the Vancouver's position. I think from here. From here, um, yeah. But maybe it's even better for black to take with the king. Maybe, maybe kind of for rook g1. Yeah, the idea being that you can't actually uh, you can't take my pawn. Oh, I see. I think he has to play here. You just take. But then I take here, right? So this but I think black should take enough there with the king. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was this, this was critical. And now I think uh, I could be in trouble. So and king okay. e2. King e2, king yeah. e2. But now I think now I think we're cooking. Um, it's not that fun to come up with ideas here. I think already I tried to set up this position. Right. So rook g1. I think this is the most like a three. Um, but then I can here. Yeah, king d two. King d two. I would actually, if I could just get this pawn off the board, I think I, I, I would be okay because then I can check back and forth, right? Um, actually, this yeah, this could this. Uh, right. Why why just trying to set up this van current position that it's but this, this even rook tough for is, GMs, But right now it's hard to. Set I, I, I don't think this is possible if black is a, if black times is well. Um, but yeah, I think this is this is this is enough. But King G three is too creative. King G three. <laughs> he's thinking about checkmate. I mean, granted, this guy, poor guy, he's tired. And at this point, I sense an immediate opportunity to play rook f one. And okay, uh, during the USS Championships, I, I took note of some what some grandmasters would do in critical positions. I noticed one thing with Dan Leroditsky does. He makes a move. Black is a critical decision, and immediately he gets up from the board and he doesn't go back until Black makes his move. So then that way his face doesn't reveal anything, mm -hmm. right? At this point in the game, I realize, wait a minute, if black blunders, I win. And I think black can only draw at this point, assuming I don't screw up, which asterisk did. Um, <laughs> but I, I picked up the queen from my side of the board as if it were blitz, I put it on my side of the board and I immediately walked away. I watched Josh Riddell's game for a little bit. I went to the back of the room. I, I looked at some of the other late games going on. I think Eugenia Torrey's game was still going on, so I took a brief look it's at this. It's such a boss move to grab the queen. Grab the queen, put it down. And of course, in this position, all the spectators are looking at me like, wait, 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 what are you doing? Because in their mind, this is like, okay, well, okay, black is always going to bail out with this, so black cannot be worse. Um, but okay, we used the same ideas before. And of course, I am in time to set the button to zero by one move. Yeah, it'd be again. if you weren't. <laughs> it would not be funny if I were, because that'd be the saddest way to lose of all time. No, um, but like he missed it and he missed it, so just be funny if in this line somehow he's he's up the tempo. But obviously, no, it's no, a no. Uh, and then of course, if he goes this way, trying to pick up this pawn again, if he takes the the, the the things don't change, and if he gets greedy, I think I actually win now. Well, uh, okay, this four. this would be a blunder. Rook b four here, here. Okay, maybe not win, but uh, certainly not losing. This is certainly the most excited I've been. I take your pawn. Right? Is, oh, wait, there's mating ideas. Oh, wait, wait, no. I check once. Rook f3. Oh. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm, gonna be careful, I'm a little bit too excited. Um, okay, so here I think it's critical we play. Yeah, just play rook But rook f4 one. again. Rook f4, you give check. Rook f3. Then you take, and then you push. Oh, there we go. <laughs> then, 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 that's how we do this. So for, for our audiences who are trying to figure out why... And then that, this, this is how Black loses. This is how Black loses the game. There we go. And of course, I, it doesn't even matter, but I do promote with check. Um, I was seeing stuff like this. Right, right. Uh, of course, you know, we both got like one minute left. So a lot of the calculation is frenzied. But yeah, this That'd is the line fun. that I saw here. And then it, not this line immediately, but rather go for this pawn. And only, only uh, Black probably loses. So... There we go. I saw this. So I grabbed the queen. I'm like, "What are you going to do? Don't mess up." And so he thought. He thought. He thought. He had three seconds left. He plays this move. I thought he was actually going to bail out with the draw because he had so little time. But I think this is the best try. King to f4. I played king to h2. Rook a3 takes. Rook takes a4. And I made the one last mistake of the game. King g2. And I should have lost. Ooh. Um, the idea being that I allow this move. Rook to a2. And now my king is simply too passive. You can't trade rooks because a pawn is too close. And I cannot, because of the lack of flexibility, I have to bring in my pieces into the game this way. And look how many squares that is. We can just simply do the counting. And uh, you know, all you have to do is play rook b two, a three, a two, rook b one. Yeah. Um, this is good night moon. So 
Rook of two, Rook of two was the way to go. The idea being that King e three here. During, during the game, like I, I immediately played this move uh, King G two, and as soon as I let go, I could feel like the color of my face disappearing. So I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, keep the blood pumping for like thirty more seconds. I just need to make one more move, and luckily enough for me, for B three, yeah, I can't exactly stronger. say deserved. I can't say deserved, but uh, luckily. So let's see the difference. If you play Rook F two, why I play Rook F two? No, I mean. Uh, on move 54. Ah, so here, if I play Rook of 2. But the key idea is that as long as I have this, so I So let's say, so the idea is that he can't even move his Rook now because you have F4. I have F4, and now I'm, I get to use that Queen that I put uh, oh so nicely on the, uh, on the on my side of the board already. Uh, yeah, how, how nice of a way to turn around with this Beat. I wonder if it's legal to start pre-moving on your score sheet, just filling out that your <laughs> next move is F5, F6. Like, doesn't even matter what Well, I, I, I think that that's somewhat illegal because we know something about note-taking. Yeah. Especially in the U.S. during major games. Hey, we're, we're in um, Iceland. I, I feel like those rules still apply. <laughs> um, but okay. Um, he plays Rook to A3, and I have one last chance to redeem myself. And okay, I played this move immediately. He played here, and I thought, and I thought, and I thought, and I figured out the fortress. So um, Rook C2. By the way, it's important that this king not get stuck on this side of the board, or else black is winning, but I'm just in time, I think. Uh, well, in time is not... The way great to say it, but definitely um, I have my pieces in the right places. Rook c2, rook a1, king f2, creating this opposition because now his king goes back. I play rook to a4, a2. Okay, what's uh, wait to move and lose? Wait to move and lose. Wait to move and lose. Rook takes a2. Okay, no, but like an instructive way for our audience members. In um, a bullet game, you'd be tempted to play. Okay, this king g3. Okay, King G3, yes, this is because we have the check, right? So, like, uh, I think most of our audience members know this. You know, you need to keep the one check distance. But easy draw would be King E2, just pick up the pawn. Well, yeah, you'd figure, okay, I'm going to come pick up this, this, mm -hmm. this. But I think you're in for quite the shock when Black plays this move. Rook to H1, takes, you say, all right, time to see if I can build the bridge. But wait a minute. Black builds the bridge for you, and he's going to walk over to the other side, and you're the one losing the game. So He was hoping for this. Well, of course, this is his last chance. I, I wonder, like, I, I was trying to read his facial expression during the game. This is something I, I think I talked about during the second round. Uh, I was trying to read his facial expression during the game, and I wonder if after King G2, based on how he was looking, it kind of felt like he thought he could still win this, but then after my next couple moves, it became obvious to him. No, he's actually, I mean, I was watching the end of the game. He was completely defeated. Like, I think after A2, he would have accepted a draw. Like, well, King G2, you could have offered a draw here. Actually, legally, I can't offer a draw. No, you can't. No, because I already offered him the draw on move 30. By FIDE rules, I'm not allowed to offer him a draw until he offers me a draw and I reject. Ah. Uh, yeah, so it's actually kind of funny because now when I, okay, well, let's create this fortress first. He plays king e5, I play f4. And the idea is that simply every time he moves backwards this way, I move my rook up one. And every time he moves this way, I'm going to just simply go here. And if he, come, if he comes back, boom. Okay, but you don't even need the pawn. I don't even need the pawn. <laughs> but like, this is how I'm going to do it because now I'm, I'm going to create winning chances with every rank I go up. <laughs> you know, he, uh, he has uh, one, two, three, four chances to lose this game. <laughs> he, needs four, he needs four blunders to lose this, so uh, not too bad. King <laughs> f5, king h2. Of course, keeping this idea, rook f2 would be the tragic blunder. Mm -hmm. So this move right here. Um, so I played king h2, he played rook f1. I was tempted to give a little spite check here, but okay, rook takes a2. I still can't legally offer the draw. He plays rook takes f4, and he offers a draw. We shake hands, and whew. That sigh of relief at fighting, the end. Fighting and, game. Oh, I wouldn't even say fighting. A, very, a most undeserved result for for me. This kind of feels like a soccer game where one team takes all the shots and you just you just play like a hermit shell. You didn't even play the better game, but zero zero. That's good enough. Right. Wow. Uh, if I play like this yeah. tomorrow, I will be telling you about the game that I lost. So you know, this is such a common situation. I think with these rook in games where you're just slightly worse. You have the less active rook, and you know you just need to pitch the pawn and go active. So this is your permission for the viewer. Just give up the pawn, go active with the rook, save yourself a lot of nerves. It's such an easier defense overall. Right. Um, and for those of you guys who hope to be able to demonstrate this correctly in a game, my challenge to you is to comment on this video and tell me that I'm a noob, and then I will track you for the rest of your chess career and make sure that you don't blunder any rook any games. Yeah, yeah. So Make sure to comment noob. <laughs> comment noob, N00B. Um, <laughs> Fiona, I'm watching you. Simon, I'm watching you. Um, this would be nice to see. Um, but okay, um, what can I say? When you play 10 moves thinking that you have a simple draw, 
make you know non-committal moves, all of a sudden you find yourself in a worse position. I think already, even when he's played this move G5, it's already really hard to hold in a practical, yeah. not relaxed state. It's like, oh, what's going on? You know, already worried about it. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, don't play the Sicilian, okay? It's, it's losing. <laughs> yeah, one e five. I mean, we we've seen that this war was has worked well uh, between the two of us on hundred percent scores. So, I mean, I've got a tough game tomorrow. I've got another twenty two hundred lined up. Uh, a guy from England that actually played at the first Saturday tournament that I was at in Budapest. So, mm -hmm. uh, it will be an interesting matchup. I don't think I've never played him before. Of course, did you? You said you've played this guy before. Yes, I played him in Gibraltar last year. Last year, we had a very interesting game. So we'll use that for preparation. Oh uh, yes. Yeah, so I don't even know if the colors match up correctly yet. I, I haven't even popped open my laptop. Uh, no, it was black. I played Kings and Games. Well, don't give him any ideas. Oh, sorry. Um, anyway, so before we, before we ruin our preparation for tomorrow's game, um, this is Isaac with Kostya here, and uh, we're signing off at the halfway point of this tournament. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for watching.